Boom. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Community Voices. My name is Omar, your host, Senior Cultural Partnership Strategist for Finish Line and JD. Uh, last week, we had Carmelo Anthony, Dwayne Wade, Chris Paul, uh, Sloan Stevens. Now we get to add the one and only Stephen A. Smith to this series. Stephen, how you doing? I'm all right, man. How you doing? Doing well. Thank you. All right, cool. So let's get into it. You know, we went to Winston, uh, Salem State, class of 91 basketball scholarship as well talk to us about that transition of being a college athlete to being you know the elite sports anchor you are on ESPN well I mean you know I tried to be an athlete but when you roll up in college with a and your first year there you got a cracked kneecap you crack your kneecap in half and you have to go through reconstructive surgery you're never the same and so my basketball operations, even though I was never close to shining the shoes of the guys that you mentioned, the LeBron, CP3s, Mellows, and all of that stuff. I know I could ball compared to the average Joe, mm -hmm. uh, but ultimately it just forces you to look on life and reflect on life in a, in a, in a, in a very different way. Uh, leaning on sports heavily when you're younger, when you recognize and realize or reach the realization that you can't do that, it can be very, very scary because now you have to wonder how you're going to excel in corporate America and some of the games that you have to play in terms of maneuvering your way through that political landscape as you try to ascend and rise in the world of corporate America. You're faced with the reality that this is the challenge yep. that you that's going to be waiting for you. When you're an athlete, you're not really thinking about it. It's not to say that you're completely oblivious to it, but somewhat to a degree you are, because even though there's politics with everything that we encounter in life, you really, really, it really smacked you in the face that this is the world that's waiting for you. And are you really, really prepared to adjust to it? And when that challenge is, is thrown in your face, it's incredibly, incredibly scary uh, because the hard work doesn't scare you. Because if you're an athlete, you're going to have to work hard. You're going to have to work hard to really, really uh, master your skill set and to maximize the potential that you may have. And so putting in that work, making the necessary sacrifices and all of that stuff, that's not new. And that's not that scary. The scary part stuff that you know you can't control, but will inevitably be waiting for you. And so that's really what you had to do. And so for me, fortunately, you know, pounding the pavement, doing multiple internships at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, the Winston-Salem Journal, the Winston-Salem Chronicle, the school newspaper, and accumulating clips and, uh, clips rather, and building a portfolio, that was, the, that was my recipe to success, to outwork people and to validate for a potential employer that I'm really dedicated and really focused on doing what I'm asking to give me a chance to do. And that's what I was able to do at a very early stage in my life. And ultimately it ended up working out very well for me. Amazing. And then you were, you spoke about, especially working hard, speak on some of like those academic uh, obstacles you might've faced from like your, your youth going into college and the kind of resilience you needed to over overcome those. Well, for me, even though it certainly didn't feel that way at the time, my blessing was the fact that I got left back. Mm -hmm. When I got left back and held back for the entire fourth grade uh, of my life, uh, it was incredibly embarrassing, very humbling. I felt like an absolute dummy, um, even though I was suffering from dyslexia and really didn't know it at that particular moment in time, mm -hmm. um, you, know, you, had, uh, you had to overcome a lot of challenges. So once my sister, Linda, uh, a, a childhood friend of my family's name, Tiver, um, along with my mom, God rest her soul, um, just give me the level of love and dedication and focus that I needed, I was able to overcome that. And once I overcame that, I didn't feel like anything would stop me. Uh, I think the, you know, I often use the line, I'm brilliant because I know I'm not. I simply learn from those who are and I catapult myself from there. And I think that that is another key to my success that I never feel like I've arrived. I never feel like, I never feel like I'm the best. You know, I have the number one show in the morning and, you know, I've been, you know, people say I'm the number one talent, but from a ratings metrics, revenue, ratings, all of that stuff in the morning, I've been number one for seven years and counting but I don't go to work every morning thinking about that at all. I go to work thinking about how I have to prove and validate that I'm number one and why. Mm -hmm. And so I, 
And as a result of being able to do that, you never even absorb the fact that you've been number one. You might say it and remind yourself from time to time, give yourself a little bit of flowers, but that's for a moment. Yeah. For the most part, I wake up every day feeling like I got something to prove. Mm -hmm. And so as a result of that, you know, that started at a very early age from the time I got left back. And from the time I got left back, I've maintained that attitude throughout the course of my entire life. So that's helped my work ethic. It's helped my focus. Um, it's helped my tenacity. Um, and it's helped me have this unwavering belief system in myself. Yeah. But the belief doesn't come from me believing that I have this talent. The belief comes from my ability and willingness to learn from those who do. Mm -hmm. And my willingness to absorb the teachings of others yeah. and, use, and use that to help catapult me to another level. That's my mentality. That's where my confidence comes from. My willingness to learn, my willingness, my willingness to humble myself mm -hmm. uh, and recognize that I don't know everything, that I'm not the most talented person in the world. I just work my ass off and refuse to relent to any obstacles that you may throw in my way. My attitude is, is there somebody that can show me how to overcome them? Yeah. If there's no one, it's a different story. But if there's a way to learn how to overcome these things, I'm going to learn it and I'm going to accomplish it. Yeah. And then once you get at the top two, you can't be complacent. Like you say, you got to keep learning and keep improving and things of that nature. You know, one of the things about it, you know, you in sports and you cover sports. I mean, I tell athletes this from time to time, but for some reason they don't believe me, but that's their problem. I learn from them all the time. Mm -hmm. And, my, you know, I have to be critical of them because that's my job. So if you do something, I have to be critical of it. But yeah. just as critical as I am, I'm the same dude that'll turn around and applaud you for everything that you do. Uh, but my level of admiration for them knows no limits because I understand the work that they had to put in in order to get to where they are and in order to maintain what they've been able to do. Yeah. Uh, it takes an incredible level of dedication, focus, a willingness to sacrifice, and then ultimately uh, to, to be persistent in, in accomplishments. When we think about a LeBron James, you know, people can talk about him being a four-time champion all they want to. Mm -hmm. The thing that I applaud most for is the fact that he's always in shape. He never, te he never cheats us. He's never walked on a basketball court and you looked at him and said, he's out of shape, he's not focused, mm -hmm. he's not ready to play. You've never seen somebody like that. You look at the, the CP3, man, he's six feet tall. He's six feet tall. Just a pit bull, doesn't oh. back down from anybody, perennial all-star, stuff like that. You see Melo, and you feel bad for him because you say, damn, this brother's talented, a 24-point per game career scorer. Too bad he keeps running into LeBron. You know, something <laughs> along those lines. You know, that's about it. Way three-time champion. We know what he brings to the table and one of the best human beings you'll ever meet in your life. Mm -hmm. um, he's just a beautiful, beautiful brother. I love him a lot. And then, you know, you just see guys like this, the Damian Lillards of the world, the, the, you know, the Clay Thompson of the world, so many others, man. And you marvel at their greatness, but then you see highlights and see footage of the work that they put in. Yeah. And you just have such an incredible level of appreciation. These are not people who take their talents and skills and abilities for granted. Mm -hmm. They recognize how great they are, but they recognize the current that the challenge to sustain that level of greatness. And what they don't realize is that they serve as a source of strong inspiration because if you're covering them, who the hell are you to cover them and chronicle what they do, but then ignore how they can be applicable to you in your life. Yeah. And whatever you do, and that's one of the things I loved so much about Kobe Bryant, my man, God rest his soul. He used to talk about that all the time, the how is what it's all about. Yeah, look at what I've accomplished. Sure, that's fine, that's cool. I'm a five-time champion, scoring champion, all perennial all-star, all of this other stuff. But how yeah. did I go about doing all of these things? Pay attention to the work, the focus, the dedication, the commitment, the willingness to sacrifice. And my last point about that is that if you watch Hall of Famers speak, I'm talking about when they get, they get inducted into the Hall of Fame. Yeah. I don't care whether it's basketball, if it's football, if it's baseball, every single person that has been inducted into the Hall of Fame always takes a moment to A, thank the people who supported them, and B, 
401A, they always say they apologize for the sacrifices that they knew they had to make and how they may have alienated people along the way yeah. because they were here and they were focused on getting this. Mm -hmm. And the people who supported them recognized their commitment to that level of excellence and the sacrifice that it was going to entail, not just on the part of those athletes, but on those individuals who supported them and they supported them anyway. And that's one of the things that I religiously take away from that because Isaiah Thomas told me this a long time ago, when you're in it, it's all you're focused on. You're fixated reaching the ultimate goal because it validates all the sacrifices you may have made along the way to yourself and to your loved ones and your support base. And there's something that I think all of us should hold on to because somewhere along the way where we're in pursuit of our level of success that we covered so desperately, we've asked others to make sacrifices for us along the way. And we would not have been able to achieve what we achieved if it were not for their support. So I always pay attention to that. Absolutely. And then I go back to education real quick. Um, we speak, we see like how the difference between the, the quality of education between communities, black and brown communities, compared to that of more affluent communities. So how, what, what do you think are some steps that we as people could take to kind of minimize that gap between the level of quality between the education between the two? Well, to be quite honest with me, to, with you, I think that, you know, it, the obvious answers are that it starts with family and your support base at a very early age because you can, because people are very, very influential in your life because you're at a young, tender age. I don't know anybody in that time. And it's incredibly important that we provide the level of support and encouragement necessary not to uh, create a, a lack of motivation or uh, to do, or a dispirit to do things uh, and to push forward and to persevere. We gotta encourage young minds to go about the business of being all they can be. Sometimes it's tough love, sometimes it's not so tough, but it always needs to be love. It doesn't need to be anything else. That's number one. Mm -hmm. But number two, I also think it's adopting the mentality that we live in a day and age where um, you no longer have the excuse of saying that you're at a disadvantage in terms of pursuing what you want to go after. Because there are a multitude of obstacles and avenues to explore in order to help get you to where you want to go. Yeah. The first order is making sure everybody understands that no matter who's helping you, nobody wants your success more than you, you do. Mm -hmm. Because if somebody is helping you, but they feel they want it for you more than you want it for yourself, then it provides a disincentive to give you the assistance that you may need to propel you to new heights. You got to show that you want it. And I think that's incredibly important as well. Obviously, a college education can go a long way. Every single thing doesn't require a college education. There are forms of education that you can receive that doesn't necessarily come through traditional avenues like a college or what have you. You can go to a trade school. You can be so extraordinary that you might have a skill that doesn't require you to go to college to fine tune it. But in terms of life's experiences, networking, cultivating resources, developing and nurturing contacts that could help propel you to a different heights, understanding the difference between a mentor and a cheerleader, that a cheerleader is somebody rooting for you, but a mentor is somebody directly connected in some kind of way to what you aspire to achieve. Those are two different things, but it can be provided for you in the same person or a multitude of people. You have to know these different things and it, it should encourage you to reach out and to ingratiate yourself with a whole bunch of people because to think that you're gonna do something alone is foolhardy. Yeah. Everybody needs somebody. You need a, a mentor, you need cheerleaders, you need family or loved ones, friends, etc. But you also need people connected in the business that you want to be connected to that can serve as advisors and counselors to guide you away from potholes and pitfalls that might stand in your path or to encourage you to go down different paths where it's a bit rosier for you potentially. All of these things are things that you have to pay attention to and you have to consider while you're marching forward. And that's all forms of education that we should be engaging in, not just thinking we go to school and then we go to college and then we got a degree. So yeah. it entitles to these opportunities that we've covered it for so long. A degree similar to a high school diploma 
is a piece of paper that validates you're trainable. You can read, you can write, you can comprehend, you have that potential. But in terms of mastering an actual skill, nah, that's not the piece of paper doesn't give you that. Yeah. Actual experience provides that for you. So you have to be committed to going out and getting that experience, whether it's internships, uh, jobs, whatever the case may be, you have to be able to do that. Definitely. And then uh, last year, your alma mater uh, announced the Stephen A. Smith uh, Scholarship Fund. So speak to your relationship with HBCUs and its importance within the community and how other, you know, cultural figures or even elite young athletes that helps uh, support HBCUs. Well, I, I don't think I would be where I am today if it wasn't for Winston-Salem State and HBCU. Mm -hmm. Uh, Clarence Big House Gaines asked me to come there and play basketball for him on a basketball scholarship. And, you know, the rest was history from there. He, you know, he lectured me all the time. Uh, the late, great John McClendon, who was obviously an iconic figure in the world of uh, basketball, particularly for black colleges, was also somebody that provided counsel and tutelage for me from time to time. And it was very rarely about basketball. It was about life. Yeah. And so knowing that, um, and, and knowing that all they asked for in return was that I remembered HBCUs and I didn't neglect the responsibility to uplift them at every opportunity is a challenge that I hold near and dear to my heart because it's paid back to them for all that they've given me. Mm -hmm. And so I'll never forget it as long as I've got breath in my body. And, and more importantly than that, an HBCU, uh, it's, 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 it's hard to put into words what kind of profound impact it's had on my life. If you are black and you're going to the typical university, um, you know, you're one of the very, very few. And so as a result, it's similar to your upbringing if you're from a disenfranchised community. Outside of that community, you find yourself being very alone, very isolated, forced to face very, very daunting challenges because you're a lone ranger and you've got to find a come the multitude of obstacles that are inevitably going to be placed in your path. Um, but when you're at an HBCU, first of all, you look around and you see people who look like you, yeah. act like you, come from the same cultural background, you know, share your ethnicity, share your challenge. You're not whistling into the wind. You're not talking to deaf ears. There are people with relatable experiences, personal and professional, family, friends, et cetera all going through very, very similar things. And as a result, you don't find yourself alone. You feel offered and bold by that. Because when you're around people, similar ill, people who, who've gone through some of the things going through, what happens is that you watch them overcome. And as a result, you say, I can overcome. And because you say I can overcome, you go about the business of doing it. And that's what propels you to new heights. So, that's how I view HBCUs. That's why I preach about its importance. And yeah. that's why it's something that I impress upon. So speak to the Stephen A. Smith Literacy Foundation and how that came into fruition, the work you've been doing within the community. Well, it still hasn't been finalized yet, um, but it's definitely something that I, I want to do. I mean, I'm, I'm going to con continue to contribute to my alma mater every year. Yeah. I'm going to do um, and I'm going to continue to be the ambassador for HBCU week for as long as they'll have me. We've generated about $11.4 million in scholarships over the last two years uh, for over 400 plus, over 600 plus students uh, to attend HBCU. So I'm very, very proud of that, but we can do more. We could do better. Uh, clearly, once the pandemic subsides and we get back to normalcy, we'll definitely generate even more uh, funding uh, for, for HBCUs and students to attend HBCUs. But as it pertains to my literacy foundation, it's something that I'm going to start uh, as soon as I possibly can. And it's incredibly, incredibly important to me. Um, like I said, I grew up not being able to read. Um, I got left back in the third grade, but I got promoted back to my right grade at the end of the summer. Mm -hmm. So it was like I had got left back because I had a first grade reading level. Then I went to the fourth grade like it was nothing. Um, and then I got left back the whole year. And so even though it shows that I got left back once uh, for the year, in my mind, I got left back twice. And it was because uh, reading comprehension was incredibly, incredibly difficult for me. And so for me to overcome that and not only 
excel in life, but to excel as a journalist, yeah. as a pundit, a commentator, a radio host, a newspaper columnist, getting starting off as a high school writer and then becoming the 21st African-American in this nation's history to be a general sports columnist. Uh, to me, that's an incredible accomplishment uh, that I hold near and dear to my heart. And it gives the message that you can overcome and you can accomplish anything. And I think that it starts with the ability to read and comprehend and having the ability to educate yourself. And then to be in the streets of New York City, growing up the way that I did, um, to come in from an impoverished background, to see kids to this day who struggle to read, uh, primarily because they don't have the books available to them. They don't have laptops and iPads available to them and stuff like that. That's something that is a personal mission of mine to assist in overcoming for disenfranchised communities throughout this nation. It'll start in New York City, where my focus will lie, because that's my home, that's where I'm from. Yep. But I'm certainly going to expand from there. And um, if, if, if I can find a way, uh, if God blesses me enough to be able to pull it off, I hope that my that the literacy the literacy foundation that I ultimately start will resonate in such a fashion that it will help every inner city community in this country, because I think that that's incredibly important. That's what I'm after, and it's I'm not anti anything. Um, you know, my grandmother was white for crying out loud. I've got a whole bunch of you know relatives that are actually Latino, um, but I'm a black man, and I know. Uh, the kind of struggles that we have had in our community and how we start off behind the eight ball because the resources that we would like to be available for us or to us strictly for educational purposes are limited. Yeah. And so you walk in the streets in New York City and you look at some of these public schools and you're watching kids in line and the school ain't even ready to be opened for crying out loud those kind of things. I mean, you know, to me, it, it should rake all of our hearts. And that's where my focus is going to lie and come hella high water. You know, I'm determined to do something about that, you, sure. know, you know, to help help in any small way that I possibly can. Definitely. You know, <clears throat> outside of JD Sports and Finish Line, we love you and what you're doing and how outspoken you are as far as like, you know, issues that affect us as a community. I mean, personally, as someone I'm from the Bronx, New York, and just seeing your growth as a kid leading into now is super inspirational. And um, yeah, we'd love to help you once that um, Literacy Foundation starts. We'd love to help you and make a nice donation. So as I pull out the checkbook, we want to make a nice $20,000 donation to the Steve Naismith Literacy Foundation once it starts. Thank you, man. You got our support. And yeah, you know, you're doing amazing work. Keep it up, especially for the kids who but you know, use you as inspiration as someone who really worked hard and grinded from the from the bottom leading into where you are today compared to like I remember you mentioned one time like the Jay-Z's and like the LeBron's of the world that's like beyond American dream. That's like a, a fantasy in a sense because yeah. he's born with that God given ability where someone like yourself really grinded and going went to school, uh putting the work between internships and leading to where you are now. So thank you for the well, time. I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that, man. Thank you. And, you know, listen, the, the LeBrons, the Jay-Z's of the world and so many others, what they've accomplished is just phenomenal. And they've been incredible role models when you consider where they've come from to where they've climbed. Mm -hmm. It's just the average Joe out there will never be them. Yeah. They will never, not in a million years. Those are one in a billion odds mm -hmm. stacked again to be what, what they are. Uh, but you can be me. Yeah. You know, you can impound the pavement, you can grind, you can get your education and you can climb the ladder of corporate America. Those are things that are obtainable to any kid out there who wants it, no matter your ethnicity. And that's what I try to impart upon these kids. And I hope that message is, is resonating. Definitely. It definitely is, you know. Again, thank you again for the time and speaking with us today. And Remember? yeah. Cool. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. All the best to you. You too. Thank you for the donation. Oh, you have to do it. <laughs>